And I'd like to introduce our panelists and then just jump right into it, if that's okay. So starting off, uh, to my right, we have Amanda Marzullo, the former executive director of the Texas Defender Service. Uh, prior to joining TDS, was a lobbyist for Texas Fair Defense Project and an associate at Clay and Rosenberg LLP. She holds a JD and an MS in criminology from Penn, where she received a provost award. I'm not going to take a whack at the first one. <laughs> for interdisciplinary research, a toll public interest scholarship, and criminology in practice for best graduating thesis. She also attained an LOM from the University of Cambridge, where she was a Gates Cambridge scholar. Next, we have Vikrant Reddy. Vikrant is a senior fellow from the Charles Koch Institute. Uh, he worked for a small state-based think tank before that, I understand. Um, he formerly of uh, Texas Public Policy Foundation. Uh, he also worked as a research, a research assistant for the Cato Institute and as a judicial clerk to uh, the Honorable Gina Benavides. Uh, he is a member of the State Bar of Texas, and he serves on the Executive Committee for Criminal Law Practice Group at the Federalist Society. Uh, he graduated from the University of Texas at Austin and earned his law degree from Southern Methodist University Dedman School of Law in Dallas. Then finally, making up the rump of the panel in most of my jokes is Shannon Edmonds. Shannon Edmonds is the Director of Government Relations uh, for TDCAA, the Texas District and County Attorneys Association, uh, the largest statewide association of prosecutors in the nation. On the, pro on the conclusion of each legislative session, he authors the TDCAA's popular uh, legislative update book, which is a great resource for everybody who's even tangentially related to criminal procedure within the legislature, and I can speak from experience. Uh, between sessions, he provides training, education, assistance to his membership. He has degrees from the University of Texas at Austin, both undergrad and school of law, and he was a prosecutor in Travis County from 1993 to 2000. So can I get a quick round of applause for our panelists today? So a lot of, some panels uh, around, around uh, policy orientation are going to be pretty heavily uh, scripted in terms of maybe a 10 minute presentation and, you know, question and answers at the end. I completely buck that trend. One I like to see is I'm just going to uh, jump right into a moderated discussion and even more quickly get to question and answers so we can really kind of find out from the panel of experts uh, answers to the questions you have and are most concerned with. So jumping right in, I'm actually going to start with you, Shannon. So Shannon, one of the things that you add in this particular discussion um, is a real dose of pragmatism, I'd say. One of the things that uh, we can always count on uh, TDCA to enter into the legislative record is, you know, the true cost of something, the true implementation hurdles that it might face. What do you think is, I would say, one of the issues that people tend to overlook when it comes to actually enacting criminal justice policy, criminal justice reform, you know, at the legislature that, you know, seems a lot easier from the curb, but, you know, that, that, that torque never gets to the rear wheels. Sure. Uh, thanks, Derek. Thanks for having me here. Um, I know that one of the things that's most frustrating for our members who practice every day uh, in courts is that many advocacy groups who push certain policy changes uh, don't either have the practical experience or don't care about some of the unintended consequences of the policies that they've adopted. And prosecutors are often uh, well equipped to point out, well, if you move this piece here, this is what's going to happen on the chessboard, and you're going to end up in a worse position than you started. But that's not always something that um, some of the advocacy groups who come to the legislature to push criminal justice reform issues are as well versed in. Um, I will say TPPF does a good job of putting out uh, background papers and doing research by people like Derek and Mark and other folks that do try to identify some of those problems, so that's welcome. But you know, anytime you're talking about procedural issues, which really to prosecutors is oftentimes even more important than uh, you know, uh, who's gonna get the death penalty or what's the punishment gonna be for something, Prosecutors are most interested in that toolbox that they have to do the jobs that they've been elected to do. And frequently, the problem is that someone proposes a, a solution to you know, increase due process or add steps, and they have no idea how they're going to pay for it. Because in the criminal justice system, the main cost, at least in the courthouse, is people. It's personnel. It's lawyers. And lawyers aren't cheap. And if you try to do it on the cheap, which is how we frequently do it in Texas, you end up with problems that people uh, complain about, and in some cases, rightly so. But I usually tell folks the reason it is the way it is 
is because the Texas legislature decided that was the cheapest, most minimal way to deliver that, that process or that result. And if you want to increase due process, you're going to have to increase the lawyers, the courts, and the cost. And that's never a popular thing to tell the Texas legislature. Now, I think that's a, that's a very good and advised point. Uh, now, in this uh, day and age of reality TV, jumping into the food fight right away, I'm going to go to uh, Amanda and ask, what are we actually underfunding then in uh, the courtroom that we could increase, or what are we overspending on? I'd say the, the justice system. I'd say, in general, the justice system is doing a poor job of prioritizing the cases. Like sort of, if, if we're talking about overspending, we're really underspending across all cases. You know, on the capital level, even, even in those cases, I think attorneys are underspending compared to their counterparts outside of Texas. Um, we have very few public defender offices that are equipped to fully investigate their case. Um, the standard of practice, I'd say, in general, is quite low in Texas. And that, I'm speaking as a defense attorney. I am not one of the advocacy groups that doesn't represent people in court. TDS has clients at every phase of the proceedings against a defendant. Um, so from a low-hanging fruit standpoint, I think that Texas is overdue for a discussion of what people we kick out of the room, who do we put in to diversion, what cases really merit the expenditure of all of the resources? Because due process is expensive. I, I think Shannon's right there. We need to spend more money, but it doesn't mean that we need to spend more money in every case. I'm gonna ask the same question to you, Vikrant. It's kind of from a, uh, from a 30,000 foot point of view, where do you feel, in Texas or even in criminal justice across the country, do you feel that we're maybe A, leaving money on the table by spending it on A instead of B? Or if we uh, you know, spend a little more here, we could have a little more savings there. Do you identify any of those particular things uh, readily? Well, so I'll say two things. First, you asked the same, oh, should I grab a microphone? I, don't have I think you're, you might be sitting on it. Am I sitting on it? No. 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 Oh, maybe. <laughs> Maybe I took yours, who knows? All right, so you asked me the same question, and I'm gonna give, in part, the same answer. Uh, I think indigent defense is probably one area that's really badly underfunded. And, uh, you know, you, you go up against the awesome resources of the government, you've got to have uh, adequate representation behind you, and it's something that is so difficult to get the American people to care about. I saw this polling, it was really depressing. It, sh it was uh, separating the way Republicans and Democrats um, thought about indigent defense. And as you might imagine, people on the left cared a little bit more about indigent defense, but honestly, on their list of priorities, it didn't crack the top 10, it barely made the top 20. And if that's the kind of challenge you have on the left, you can only imagine the challenge you're having on the right. A lot of people just didn't see the significance of that issue. So I think that's probably an underfunded area. There are other areas, though, where I think maybe the funding is moving in the wrong direction. And these are the kinds of issues that basically, Derek, you and I have worked together on for 10 years. And that's the way that so much money gets shuttled into incarceration and using the cages as the solution to the problem when instead you could use things like uh, treatment, uh, both mental health and drug and alcohol treatment, by the way, that would uh, help people on the front end so that you wouldn't have to spend the money on the cages on the back end. That's actually an excellent preface uh, to, to move on down the line to Shannon on. So Shannon, you and I have had several conversations on, on the funding of the criminal justice system pursuant to uh, you know, different policy initiatives. If you had a magic wand, you know, Perish the thought. But if you had a magic wand and were able to design a funded criminal justice system in, in the most effective and efficient way that, that you could see possible, what would that look like? Where would the locus of funding be? You know, what would the pathways of funding be? And who would be making that? Would it be local? Would it be state-based, hybrid of the two? Well, at, in Texas right now, the majority of funding is at the local level, but it's generated oftentimes by fees on the people who are going through the system, which is not ideal because if you've been to a courtroom they don't always have a lot of money um, and we're squeezing them pretty good the problem is or, or the uh, I guess the benefit from 
the viewpoint of the people in the big pink building over here is that they're not having to pay as much for it, right? And so I think most people in your local courthouses in Texas are going to say, we're happy to keep local things local, um, but having to fund operations based off of the number of cases that come through or fines or things like that can create some perverse incentives. So ideally, it would be better if it was something that got debated uh, at the legislature, because it doesn't. It's not even a speed bump in the budget process. They just kind of see how much is coming in. That's how much we're going to send out. And they rarely have talks about making uh, substantial investments in the system. And I'll tell you, the one time in recent history that they did, although it's almost past history, was in 2007 when they made a substantial justice reinvestment, several hundred millions of dollars in the types of treatment programs that we've been dis discussing here, and it had a positive impact. It, they spent a little bit money to save more money. And you think, yeah, that makes perfect sense, but it is so hard trying to talk them into making that investment up front because for those who run on a two-year cycle, they may not be in office to see that benefit come down and they're only looking to the next election. So it's always a challenge to uh, try to go to the legislature to ask for more funding for some of these programs that we're talking about. And, and there, now that we got the, the crass money discussion out of the way, you know, it's in politics to talk about that amongst friends. Um, one thing I do want to go into and where I really want to rely on everybody on this panel's, I, I would say, uh, comparative advantage uh, and looking at the system is since this is a panel, you know, primarily on criminal procedure, I'd like to ask you, and we'll just, we'll just go down the line. We can start, we'll start with Amanda, go to Vikrant, and then Shannon. What would you say is the, I would say the gap in, or the largest gap, I should say, in criminal procedure? This doesn't need to be pursuant to a, a cost-benefit question, but if you could change one thing that would make the criminal justice system more blank and fill in the blank uh, for your own values, what would you change? Why? Where are blind spots? Can I pick two? You can pick one and a half. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I, I think, you know, I think Shannon pointed out when we were talking before this panel that we've had some zombie bills in recent cycles where people keep bringing up the same issues. And one of them is pretrial release. And I think, you know, it probably isn't feasible to expect bail reform to happen next session. But, you know, as someone who works in the justice system, I hope that there could be a compromise on some of the cases. You know, we are in a situation where thousands of people are detained pre-trial for no reason other than that they can afford the bail. It has nothing to do with their threat to society. It has nothing to do with the charges against them. They're by and large nonviolent misdemeanors we should figure out a way to make sure that they can get out of jail and keep their employment. Because the longer they're detained, the more likely they are to recidivate. Um, and I'd say sort of the other issue that I see as being a problem is that our grand jury system isn't operating the way it should. I mean, really, the grand jury is supposed to be a second opinion on the charges against a defendant. And if you go to a doctor for a second opinion, you want that doctor to see all of your medical records. You don't want them to just read the diagnosis. And what we have with the grand jury process is that there's no non-hearsay requirement. So that means that summary evidence is presented to the grand jury. And that makes a lot of sense. But I do think that a requirement that prosecutors present the counter argument if they're aware of it. Like, you know, the eyewitness suffers from glaucoma and wasn't wearing their glasses at the time that they saw this event. That that is something that the grand jury hears about. Um, also, restricting the grand jury so that they're really only looking at whether a crime occurred and not into someone's private business. And, a, you know, and this is going to cost more money, but a, a recording requirement. Um, it's right now you get prosecutors get to pick and choose whether the grand jury proceedings, meaning the testimonies, not the deliberations, are recorded. That should be uniform across the state. 
Well, I'm sure the uh, the situation in Washington right now, everyone's going to return to the legislator next session as grand jury experts. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not, that is not how... Yeah. <laughs> not, not an ounce of cynicism in that comment. Vikrant, same question. Well, so what you asked was, if I could make the criminal justice system more X, and then you allowed me to fill in the blank, and then how do I do it? So I'm going to fill in the blank with focused. I want to get the criminal justice system more focused. You know, I agree with, I guess Shannon didn't quite phrase it this way, but I'm sure he agrees at this point. There are genuinely dangerous people out there. There are genuinely uh, people that we've really got to be careful about, and we've got to focus our criminal justice resources on those folks. I am not a softy, hug-a-thug type when it comes to crime. I get the reality of it. But what I'm trying to say about the criminal justice system is let's focus the resources on those people not on the people who pose less of this threat to public safety. So there's so many ways that we do this. As one example, TPPF does a lot of work in the overcriminalization space. Get rid of some of the silly, unnecessary crimes out there so that you can focus the resources you have on the really serious criminals. Uh, Amanda was talking a little bit about bail. Refocus your system so that you're more concerned with how dangerous a person is while they're awaiting trial, not on how much money they have in their bank account. That's a way that you get a little bit more focused. Uh, when we talk about the way we handle things like drugs, look for opportunities to take people who have chemical addictions and help them with things like drug courts so that you can focus your resources on people who are dealing drugs, who are hardcore kingpins, who are people of that sort. That's what I would really like to see more out of the criminal justice system, is this kind of focus. In some places, it's going to require spending a little bit more money, but I think in some places, it's just going to require uh, a little bit more common sense. Shannon. <clears throat> so uh, my first blank, and to, to make the system more blank, I'd say more just. And one of the reasons why I emphasize that is because frequently in today's world, People look at criminal justice reform in a very utilitarian manner. How can we reduce crime? How can we uh, help get people back on their feet? That's all well and good, but the system exists so that people feel a sense of justice when cases are being resolved. And justice can be both a process and a result. Um, so I'm going to take one on each of those. I'm going to take my one, one and a half. For a result, one of the things that prosecutors have sought frequently, something that we have in child sex abuse cases, when children are victims, the prosecution is allowed to introduce evidence of other uh, abuse that the defendant may have committed in the same manner against this kid or other kids so that the jury can have corroboration for what that child is saying. Because otherwise, it's just that child's word when you're trying to send someone to prison for potentially a very long time, and we allow other evidence to come into guilt innocence. I think a lot of prosecutors, in the wake of the Me Too movement and a new um, recognition of how adult sexual assault victims can be impacted by this and have challenges in testifying, would like to see that same rule in adult sexual assault cases. That, and think of the Bill Cosby case, right? Bill Cosby, he get tried the first time, the jury only hears from one victim, they hang, they can't come to an agreement. He gets retried, that judge allows in other uh, testimony from other victims of his, he gets convicted once the jury got the full picture. So that's one of the things that prosecutors would like to see from a procedural point of view. Um, and so that's a just result. The other thing on a just procedure, that's something that I know prosecutors have advocated for a lot in Texas is, uh, we have the most one-sided discovery system in the country. Texas is the only jurisdiction in the country where the defense doesn't have to provide anything to the state, anything to the prosecutor, except expert witness notice, and if they're going to use an alibi, um, everything else, they get to play hide the ball. And that makes the system very inefficient. A lot of times, it could help resolve cases before trial, when a prosecutor learns, oh, my case has problems, the defendant doesn't have to tell him any of that stuff. And of course, in the wake of the Michael Morton Act, prosecutors are divulging everything and yet getting nothing in return. And we're the only state that does that. So that's the other thing that I think prosecutors have advocated for in the past is mutual 
discovery obligations to help work out these cases beforehand because going to trial, even though a lot of people think we don't try enough cases, prosecutors, you become a prosecutor to try cases, right? Our folks love to try cases, but they're very expensive, they're very time consuming, and you wanna make sure you're trying the right cases, not getting halfway into a trial and having your case fall apart because the defendant or the defense lawyer kept something in his back pocket and only revealed it to the jury and not to you when you might have dismissed the case ahead of time. Mutual discover. I knew this panel would get out of hand sooner or later. <laughs> um, but actually, I want to I kind of segue and circle back to something that we talked about earlier. So we did talk a little bit about pretrial, a little bit about bail. And you all, you each have different perspectives on it. And Vikrant mentioned it as, um, as an issue for possible reform. And I, I think that, you know, there definitely is a, you know, to contextualize this, there is definitely a, a hunger to move towards a more risk-based system. But to a point that Shannon might make is, uh, you know, well, what does that look like? How are we going to do it, right? And so I want to delve into that just for a minute here. And we're, we're just going to work our way down the panel again. But let me pose the question as such. So what should the bail system look like in terms of brass tacks? How should it run? And when I say bail, I just mean you can take that more pretrial writ large. How should it run? And what sort of results would we see if it were successful under your rubric? It's a simple question. <laughs> Um, and everything I'm about to say is with the caveat that I really want to see what happens in Harris County right now in terms of their releasing individuals based on the charges against them. I think it's a really innovative approach and it could work and it could be a solution to some of the problems with risk assessments. That said, I don't, I think the state should kind of wait and see what happens there. I have no issue with risk assessments, and I think they probably should be used in bail determinations, but the devil is in the details here. It really depends on what information you're using. You know, criminal histories are a good predictor of future offending, but only if you look at certain types of convictions. You know, someone's drug-related history isn't necessarily indicative of their ability to commit a crime. And we also want to make sure that we're not discriminating against people in how we're looking at the data. And, and I would add to that, that when we look at criminal archetypes, we're also talking, you know, there are overlaps between substance abuse offenses, violence offenses, and property offenses. But there are also, I would say, typologies of offender that are completely within one silo. And we're trying to make a system that addresses everybody across the board when you know, their actual offending varies greatly. Yeah, and so, and also going back to spending more money, um, I think that both parties should be represented at the proceeding by attorneys, meaning prosecutors should be in the room, defense attorneys should be there on the part of their clients. I mean, I was a defense attorney for a long time in a jurisdiction that required it, and I never had a client pay a bill, ever. Um, and we're talking about some very violent felonies, but it was because I was there, I had time to talk to my client, I had time to talk to the victim, sometimes the victim's family, and to make the argument that my client was appropriate for release. And can I just jump in and say, I, I mean, most people don't realize, it, their knowledge of the criminal justice system is from watching Law and Order. Right, guy gets dragged up, we're gonna have a remand hearing, what does the prosecutor say, what does the defense lawyer say, judge makes a decision. That doesn't happen that way in Texas. There, in 99% of the cases, there are no lawyers present when the judge is making that decision. The DA in Dallas County, John Crusoe, just had, just had a, a, an op-ed published where he had to correct the Dallas Morning News opinion uh, uh, editorial board because they assume that's how these decisions get made, and it's not. And one of the reasons it's not is because it costs a lot of money to have lawyers all working around the clock doing bail hearings. So Texas has taken the cheap route and not provided for those lawyers to be involved in that process. And then sometimes the judges have inadequate information on which to make their decisions. Yeah, and when I went around, the, the first thing I did when I came to Texas was do court observations across the state. And you know, I was really surprised to find out that it's very rare, actually, for the magistrate 
to be a lawyer and that a lot of people in misdemeanor court are appearing in front of county judges who have no idea what the defendant's rights are. They actually turn to the prosecutor pretty often and say, is it true that they have a right to counsel? Like, th I, I was sh surprised by that. Um, but it's, I will say, this is a problem throughout the country. This isn't just Texas. Yeah, and, and to give it a, a little bit more flavor, again, it's the way magistration works in Texas is both a product of kind of the decentralized, devolved court system that we've, well, we're, had to adopt of being such a vast state, but also because of just, you know, I would say sheer volume, because I remember if you look at felony magistrations alone, we're talking something on the order of like 230,000 a year. Um, and and like, like both of them have said, it actually falls upon uh, magistrates, whether it's uh, whether it's a justice of the peace, whether it's a county judge. Um, now, county judges do have to be lawyers, don't they? They do not? Oh. No. Oh, no. oh my. Um, well, I, 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 did know that, uh, I did know that justice of the peace uh, is about 10% um, and, and going forward. But that's a, you know, that kind of just shows what, what's at play procedurally. And I think that that's one of the er hurdles to overcome in any reform proposal is going to be one that actually, you know, deals with the talent at hand and what can we do in the best way possible to achieve what those ends are. But Vikran, I don't want to cut you out of this conversation. No, I guess all I'd want to add is that um, bail is kind of a curious problem. And, and Derek, you and I were talking about this this morning. There are two parts to the problem, and one is really well understood. The other, I think, is less well understood and less well talked about. The first, the easily understood part, is that there are people who sit in these jails waiting for trial, who are not dangerous, simply because they can't afford to bond out. They don't have the money. And those, these are sad stories, and people make movies and TV shows about these characters, and that's, we all feel like we have a good handle on that problem. But there's actually a second problem, which is that some people are really dangerous. They have perfectly flush bank accounts, and they can afford to bond out, and then you got these dangerous people roaming the streets simply because they had the money for it. But they're both, at root, the same issue, which is that we're making these decisions based on uh, bank accounts rather than based on dangerousness. And I have to say, I have a lot of friends on the left and try to work closely with my partners on the left on this issue, but this is an area where I, I really wish my friends on the left would, um, would have a little bit of pragmatism about, about these bail questions because on the one hand, I understand being very upset about uh, people who don't have enough money to bond out, wasting away in prisons. We don't want that to happen. So now we want to move towards risk assessments and trying to get a sense of how dangerous these people are. But then my friends on the left say, well, no, I don't know if I like the risk assessments because they seem like they're going to uh, have racial biases coded into them and they're going to produce all of these uh, racially disparate outcomes that I don't like. I sort of shrug my shoulders and say, well, you know, we're we're trying to move away from a fairly ugly system. This is a solution. Have you got some third option? And I'm not hearing it come forward other than just don't put anybody in jail before a trial, and that's simply untenable. So actually, you are hearing it come forward in uh, California, New York, and, <laughs> and then we see kind of the, you know, I believe that even the, you know, some of the more liberal establishment in New York saying, we kind of messed up this whole bail thing. You know, it's, it seemed really good in California when the bondsmen and the ACLU were on the same side, you know, that we were able to go through this. And so I think that's actually a good point to, to drill in on is the fact that, the crunt that you mentioned is that we have two different axes here. We have financial status, however you define it, and then you have actuarial risk. And the problem is when we actually conflate the two, and people don't understand that simply being indigent does not make you not a risk. And that's where I think some of the, some of the judicial prom, judicially promulgated bail practices that we see some places tend to get out over their skis. And they tend to actually say like, well, this person doesn't have money and therefore we're gonna release him. That only shows though, as to your point, that we are basically using whether or not this person can post as a proxy for risk, and which is you know, a very, very poor substitute uh, for doing so. So, and Derek, can I touch on one other thing? Please. That talking about the system being just, another aspect of why we ask for bail is to make the, sure the person shows up for court. And that's something that, rare, again, from a utilitarian perspective, it's just, well, is this person a risk or not? Are they going to reoffend? 
But if you're a victim in a criminal case and your defendant gets bonded and doesn't come back, justice delayed is justice denied. And so the idea behind bail was to create a security that would keep that person wanting to come back to court at risk of losing a bunch of money. Now, it doesn't necessarily work the way uh, it's drawn up on paper every time, but again, the reason I would say that the state relies on private bail bondsmen is because the alternative is to use a government-run pretrial services department where government employees are doing the job of the bail bondsmen, and you are all paying for those pretrial service folks. Whereas if you outsource that work to a bail bondsman, all of a sudden the government doesn't have to pay for it. So it's again another way Texas can scrimp on spending in the system and try to get a similar result, whether or not it works all the time is I'll, I'll yeah, go as I, uh, I was gonna say I'll go as far as to agree that it uh, pushes off the surety aspect of it, not the public safety aspect. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, people who have looked at this have also shown that, you know, bail bondsmen are antiquated. You know, they rarely bring in somebody when they've skipped bond. They often don't pay up when someone fails to appear in court. So really, they're just sort of siphoning off the system. And I think, you know, back in the old West, it made sense when law enforcement wasn't in communication across city, county, and state lines, but that's not the world we live in now. Um, so I think it, it's worth taking a look at to see who's bringing these folks in. And I imagine it's law enforcement, not the bail bondsmen. And, and that's something I just want to add is that there's actually an interesting effect that if you look at what's uh, with, with gang violence and, and so on, one of the things that's in vogue now and more people are looking into is some of these focused deterrence strategies. and. One of the predictors, at least anecdotally speaking, in the salience of a focused deterrence strategy is whether or not there is preventative detention allowable or even sometimes if, you know, they have a loose enough bail system that it, preventative detention by proxy can happen, which of course is, again, not in the interest of public safety. So we've seen people that have gotten what was thought a preventative bond and be out the next day because they've had access to, uh, access to means. And so one of the issues is, is if you can't preventatively detain these dangerous individuals, then we're, there's no way you can get away from that risk system. And I think that that's one of the, uh, one of the debates looming uh, in this next legislature, which I'm sure we'll all throw pies at each other and uh, you know, have that food fight when it happens. But I, I, wanna, I wanna zoom back out. I wanna, wanna kinda let, uh, g give a little more uh, creative control of the panel to the panelists. I'd like to just pose a question as such. There ought to be a law that. And then fill it in however you'd like. Amanda. You can, can pass. Make, yeah, I can pass. <laughs> we'll come back to you, though. There ought to be a law that requires getting rid of other laws. <laughs> I mean, I've got some fairly libertarian sympathies. It's very difficult for me to to end a sentence that starts with, there ought to be a law that. But I do know that laws tend to just sort of get stuck in place and never ever change. And I'm a big fan of various types of sunset reviews and things like that. I think we could use a lot more of that in American criminal justice because just as a small example, you see all kinds of technological changes every single day. Uh, you know, we had a big conversation uh, that took up about 10 minutes of our time about bail and about uh, how to keep track of people before trial, and we never talked about electronic monitoring, which is increasingly a part of that conversation. It wasn't a part of that conversation in the Old West, and when we have old techniques that date back to 1880, they don't make sense anymore. There are just dozens and dozens of ways that um, I want to make sure we have a good system for <laughs> purging laws and procedures in the books that we don't need anymore. Before you move on, can you talk really quickly about the Minnesota unsession? Oh, yeah. <laughs> You know, so Minnesota had a unsession. They called their legislators in not to pass new laws, but just to review laws that were in the books that didn't need to exist that they could get rid of. I thought this was a really creative idea. I also, I happen to know, uh, just because my family's from India, India did something like this too. And they had all these bizarre laws that, 
that you know came from like colonial England about treatment of elephants and weird stuff that just had no point in the way modern India worked and they purged these kinds of things too. This is the sort of stuff that I'd love to see happen in Texas. Well, as much as I don't know if I'd want to see the enervation of the elephant treatment law lobby, I think that's uh, that'd actually be something that we could talk about now. Kachani, by the way, let me clarify one thing: I am very pro elephant. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, folks. He sounds pretty soft on elephant to me. So, um, but hey, can you imagine though the di- the legislative dynamics? I think that would be very very interesting. Be interesting. Yeah. So, Shannon, same question: there ought to be a law of that. You know, kind of like the Kron, uh, we keep track in our own eyes. So it's not an exact science, but we keep track of how many new crimes are created by each legislature. I think this most recent one, um, they created 49 new crimes. They average over the past 15 years, they average in the 40s, mid 40s, 45 or so new things that used to be legal that are now against the law every two years years. And rarely do those ideas come from prosecutors. Uh, There's always two or three, for instance, you know, maybe like a a question like a new revenge porn law, something keeping up with technology because criminals find a way to always stay one step ahead of the law and misuse the new technology that we have. But by and large, these are not being driven from people uh, in the criminal justice system. It's some constituent somewhere who says there ought to be a law against this. And they go to their local legislator who says, sure, why not, not having a global view of it. So I'm going to second your idea, or maybe a, a rule that says, uh, you know, before you can create a new crime, you have to take two off the books. That's, that's my <laughs> wife's rule for ball caps in my closet, right? <laughs> before I get another ball cap, two of them have to go. It's only going to take me about six years to get rid of them all. But um, the... Um, so I think that's a good start. And one thing that the, at least the Texas House has done is to uh, put some signals in their rules that they use so that the members know, hey, this bill creates a new penalty. So one of the, I don't know if it'd be a law, but maybe it would be a new House and Senate rule, is that if a bill is going to create a new crime or increase or decrease the punishment for an existing crime, it's got to go through one of the criminal committees. All right, and we saw this most, uh, uh, the problem resulting from this really demonstrated with this hemp law that passed. They went through the agriculture committees, causing all of these headaches in criminal justice. Nobody in criminal justice even had a say in it because it was all being handled by committees where there was no subject matter expertise in one of the unintended consequences to it. And that's how bad laws uh, end up having bad consequences. And, and let me just just to, to buy Amanda a little bit more time. Uh, no, I was, was going to say, Shannon, since you actually do put that uh, that list together biennially, what is the best? I'll even say boutique laws uh, qualify as well. What's the best new law that you ever put in the TDCA report? We all know like these blue laws, or you know, it's illegal to look at a duck from an airplane. Things on a Tuesday. What is one of the weirdest ones we have in Texas? So first, let me praise Texas because by and large, we have gotten rid of all of our old archaic elephant and other related laws. Um, It's no longer a crime to carry fence cutters in your back pocket. And like I saw somebody tweeting the other day. Uh, So we've modernized our statutes, but we do have some some good ones. Uh, One of my favorites was practicing chiropractory while intoxicated. If you're cracking somebody's back and you're drunk, that's a state jail felony. I don't know why. I don't know what case (laughs) led to that, Um, but, and I also doubt it's ever been used. We have tons of things to get put on the books, but nobody tracks their use, and so it's probably never been used, but um, that's that's one of my favorites, and there's uh, all kinds of interesting little boutique crimes like that, or punishments when we increased the punishment for stealing uh, copper, or other uh, metals that pe- because people were stealing them from businesses, so we had to increase the punishment. What also meant if you stole a six pack and it was bottles that had a certain type of bottle cap on it, that might be a higher punishment than if you just stole a can that was made out of a non metal on that list. I mean, it makes no sense, but 
a lot of times the legislators aren't thinking of it making sense, they're thinking of making a constituent happy. And that's how we get some of those laws. I was hoping you were gonna say oyster harvesting. <laughs> Can I offer that, mine? That's Scott Henson's oh, the Hall of Infamy. Uh, white whale. Yeah. I just have to say, because when, when I worked at TPPF and I was here for five and a half years, I remember the most ridiculous criminal law, and I still talk about it all the time, it was lying in a fishing contest. That, I think it was 2013 that that was passed, and as far as I know, it's still in the books, so don't Came out of Rockwall County. Competition. There you go. Got to hear both sides. Got to hear both sides. <laughs> Amanda. <laughs> All right. Um, you know, if I could have anything, what I'd like to do is have create a system that centralizes information on criminal cases in Texas. I mean, really, right now, we have... You know, 180 district courts, 254 different counties, and we're reliant on information that's reported by local clerks, and they often don't. And we don't know a lot of information about who appears when there is a jury summons. What does that look like? Um, what is, how many capital cases there are? Everybody calls me up, or in my old job, I used to receive at least a monthly call from someone, usually in the government, asking how many death penalty cases there are in Texas. I have no idea. I have my count based on newspaper clippings, but no one can give you that figure. And, and so we're, we're coming up on, uh, on the time for the moderate discussion. I want to open it up for question and answer so y'all can... Uh, uh, Y'all can uh, influence this conversation as well, but I want to leave you with one last question, and that was something you just mentioned, Amanda. That I think that we all have different perspectives on on this stage, but is under discussed overall, and that is the issue of data. So let me just again, we're going to give you your magic wands back, and so if I could ask, what sort of reform in data do you think would be uh, most valuable uh, to, in your perspective on the criminal justice system? And just so before Shannon gets to it, it's, it's all free. This is your magic wand moment. I, I want to know who's responding to jury summonses. Um, I think that that's important. We, we don't know what those demographics are. And it's important to have the whole community represented in a jury. For the, the system's sake, I'm not even speaking from a defense attorney standpoint, but if we're having sections of the community not represented, then our court system isn't for the whole community. And that's what we want. I guess I probably want a better sense of how many people in the state and really in the country are walking around with criminal records. We don't know. We don't have a, a really good estimate on how many people have that kind of background, how many people have been arrested, how many people have uh, spent time behind bars. We have all these different kinds of estimates that we've been able to put together, but we don't really have a good handle on that number, and I, I'd be really interested in knowing what that figure is in a, a more precise way. Shannon, what beans aren't we counting? Yeah, I don't even allow myself to think about this because it is so expensive, I know <laughs> it's, it's not going to happen preface just I in offer. general. So that's my preference. So <laughs> if we're in Maple Leaf world, um, well, two things came to mind. Um, one of them is uh, there's been some widely disparate numbers going around about the prevalence or problem of human trafficking in the state. And um, some of the numbers literally strain credulity. And some of the research has even said, yeah, those numbers, those weren't really meant to be used for policy. Um, so it'd be great because that's such an important issue to so many people. And it's an issue that everybody, a lot of, times left and right agree we need to do something about it, but we need good data on who is actually out there that needs to be helped. Um, then the other thing I would say on a criminal records issue is, and this is from our members, it can take them months or years to get certified records from the prison system to use to introduce at trial to show that that person has a criminal history. And if he's been to prison before, it can increase the punishment for his new case. Because of underfunding, it can take more than a year to get the only piece of paper that can establish your fact that you have to prove as a prosecutor, all because the state chooses not to fund that part of the prison system. And that is, an, that is inefficient. It's unjust to the victims of those folks whose cases can't go to trial until that paperwork's done. And um, so that's a real 
kind of inside baseball change, but it would make such a big difference in moving these cases and helping victims. It's kind of funny to think that the process takes longer than the enhancement it seeks to affect upon the sentence, right? Okay, well, we get to the, we're getting to the uh, question and answer portion of uh, the program today. So if you'd like to raise your hand, my colleague Michael right here will come by and present you with a microphone. The only thing I ask is that you please keep your uh, question in the form of a question, meaning two, three sentences at most with an upward inflection on the last one. Um, <laughs> and uh, not only that, but also that it is less, it's something that is able to be answered by, you know, somebody on here just... In other words, no questions. It's like, well, maybe we should just get rid of all police. What do you think? And then, and Vikrant, you're barred from ask, answering that if it is asked. So <laughs> you said something about libertarian leanings. So who you got? Oh, got several people over here. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah, I want to ask, direct this to Vikrant uh, and the Institute. Um, there is this creative, we'll call it, tension between how much the stuff costs and we got to keep taxes low. And the, you guys have all been uh, elucidating that uh, the justice system um, needs uh, to do better. Uh, and um, I'm a CASA volunteer, which you may know uh, about that, the Child Protective Services. And so uh, the cool thing is that each one of these cases has multiple attorneys um, and uh, other associated uh, folks who have billable time, but they augment that and give the, uh, the volunteer a, a legal entity called a guardian, uh, guardian ad litem and so forth. And so I have a, uh, not only a responsibility, but an, an avenue to go and seek information which we present to the judge. And so what I'm asking is that, is the Koch Institute doing things to take a look at efficiencies where you can deputize the community uh, in other areas, maybe because this is a child pr protective situation, but I'll bet you there's others in the, all, all the subjects you've been talking about to try to get both balance between cost and uh, fairness. Uh, so Jack, we don't we don't do at the Koch Institute work in you know child protective services that sort of thing. So I I won't get into that. But I, I take your broader point, which is that there is this tension that you want to solve these social problems. Some of them require spending money. On the other hand, you want to be careful about how much money is being spent and what kinds of resources you're asking of taxpayers. But I think it's absolutely a good point. Um, and there are places where we look at those kinds of questions about efficiencies. I'll, I'll name one just because it's something that, that I've already hit upon on the panel today. So I've said, or I did say at the very beginning of the panel that I don't mind spending a little bit more money on shoring up indigent defense so that defendants have attorneys that are strong enough to go against attorneys like Shannon and his folks uh, among the prosecutors. But that's not all of what we can do to shore up indigent defense. We can also, and I've said some of this on the panel today also, find crimes that don't need to be crimes, purge them so that these kinds of things don't require legal representation moving forward. And then you can, and this is another thing I said on the panel today, focus the resources. You can focus them on the people who most uh, desperately need legal representation. And I think you can find areas like that uh, throughout the system. But I want to be a realist about this, though. At the end of the day, it may still require a little bit more money, but if that money is going towards solving some long-term problems and preventing some really long-term dysfunctions uh, in our criminal justice system, I think it's probably a reasonable trade-off. That's, that's a very good point, Vikrant. Um, the only thing I would add about that is I think that when we look at um, a lot of the overlap between issues in child protective services and criminal justice, we're talking about the same population in a lot of cases. Uh, and one of the things that we're working on in our juvenile justice capacity, along with our Centers uh, for Family and Children, is kind of the, the CPS-TJJD intersect. And so hopefully, uh, hopefully during the rest of this interim, we'll have some interesting research coming out on that. And I would also commend everybody in this uh, room to our panels put on by the Center for Families and Children that is specifically uh, on child welfare as well. Yes, I recently, uh, I am 
legally, I was legally parked in a handicapped parking spot. Now, this is a new law. I got a letter. I had parked over the line, however, and I got a letter saying I was being fined $515 for that. Uh, I went to over, because they had my husband's name. I was driving the car. He wasn't with me. And switched, and there were other people being fined the same amount for the same crime. And they said they weren't getting off the hook by going to court. Well, I decided I was going to court. And I went to court looking like the grandmother that I am and got it dismissed. But it's worth going to court for. But that's a rather new uh, law. And there are people now. I took, also took a photo of where if you were illegally parked in the handicapped parking spot, you got uh, ticketed $200. So it's something to look into. I mean. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go ahead and assign that to, to Amanda here. And I'm going to put it. <laughs> With an additional question, so why do we let cities make ordinances? Hard stop. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not. If James Quintero was on the stage, he'd have an opinion. I think I think that should be a topic for Amanda's next podcast. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we. I mean, I think in general, I, I I don't know. I think often they pass some very strange laws. There's, I've, I don't know. I I really think that their role should be the power of the purse, you know, shaping how they're spending money. That makes sense to me from a city council standpoint, but creating bizarre misdemeanors with fines that uh, don't make any sense. If you're parking legally in a handicapped spot, you're targeting someone who's handicapped. Uh, it, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's like being against puppy dogs and rainbows. You know, like it, it, it doesn't. Will you represent me next time I get a ticket? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so good for you. I'm glad you did that. And I think you know something that the Koch Foundation should be you know commended for is that I think you're funding you know legal representation for people in Class C cases, right? Or me more, personally. but. <laughs> <laughs> So see you after the panel and you'll square up with them. So that, that's good. Uh, one, thing, one thing I would like to add to that is some of the work that we've done, and I, I think Vikrant and I are about to hit on the same point, is that especially if we look at the reentry realm and you know, some of the work that we're doing with uh, our partners um, uh, across the aisle and also with our own um, Safe Street Second Chances initiative, is that when we talk about introducing fines and fees, um, again, so much of that is a death by a thousand cuts. And which, you know, Shannon rightly says, you know, a lot of the burden for process might come on the locals for unfunded mandate and it needs to get paid for somehow. You know, I, I'm personally against not paying attorneys anything, but it doesn't need, seem to go over that much. It's not doesn't seem to be that popular overall. Um, so one of the issues I think we hit on there is fines and fees. But Crown, that was something you were going to. That's well, absolutely what I was going to say, which is, ma'am, you you raise a bigger issue, which is these fines and fees that are crippling a lot of people. And. And you made a really great point about yourself. You said, look, I'm a grandmother. I can walk in there, and they're going to dismiss my ticket. But not everybody looks like an elegant and gentle grandmother, right? Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people who uh, that's just not uh, the opportunity that's presented to them. And I'll tell an anecdote just because it's on my mind and because uh, I want to pick on Louisiana because they just won this football title. <laughs> I'm going to cap this at five minutes, or Kevin will fire me. <laughs> I heard this story that I just found completely absurd about a woman in Louisiana who, just like you, got a parking ticket, and I think it was for something like $500. She wasn't in a position to afford this ticket, but she wanted to be a good citizen and try and find some way to pay it. So she sent in this partial payment. And they sent the check back to her and said, we don't accept partial payments. You've got to pay the whole thing at once. And by the way, interest is accumulating. And you know, I wonder just how many little uh, fixes like that you could have in states all over this country to help resolve these kinds of problems and they're they're just a matter of goofy government dysfunction 
Uh, but lots of people get trapped in these kinds of cycles. And like you said, not you. You've got a way out. Not everybody does. Could you discuss plea bargaining and how that affects society? Let's go, uh, let's go uh, Vacrant then Shannon on that one. <laughs> you know, th that's also really important uh, and difficult issue. So there was a report that came out last year. It was NACDL. Do you remember the name of their plea bargaining report? Oh, gosh, I wish I could. But if you Google NACDL, oh, it was the trial penalty. That's right, NACDL trial penalty. There's a really interesting report on plea bargaining um, that I think is worth reading. You know, they start with, with kind of an interesting uh, historical foundation. The founders really viewed the trial as a critical part of protecting our rights. In fact, there's kind of a, there's a joke that I probably shouldn't make, but I'll make anyhow, uh, which uh, somebody once uh, told me. They said that there were three boxes that were designed to protect our liberty, and those boxes were the jury box, the ballot box, and the cartridge box. <laughs> I said, all right, fair enough. Let's talk about the trial. Let's talk about the jury box for a moment. We've got a lot of plea bargaining taking place. In fact, the last figure I saw was 97% of all cases actually end in plea bargain rather than going to trial. And um, I'm interested to get your take on this, Shannon. But I think the concern that a lot of the people in the advocacy community have is that the sentences are so long and the ways that prosecutors are able to stack charges uh, are so numerous. Actually, I'm looking at my colleague Mark Levin. I remember a, co a conversation that Mark and I had at the time that Roger Clemens was lying in front of Congress about steroid use. And I think Mark came into my office and said, all right, Roger Clemens just committed obstruction of justice, obstruction of Congress, false statements, perjury. I mean, somebody could really stack all the charges on this guy and get to decades worth of prison time. Uh, so that's a more lighthearted example, but lots of people are facing cases where there's this charge stacking happening, all the charges carry very, very long penalties, and they say to themselves at the end of the day, it probably makes more sense to just plead out rather than take my case to trial, even if I believe I'm innocent of the charges. And uh, in that way, I think that plea bargaining has really started to erode the... Um, the importance of the trial in, in our system and in protecting our liberty. I am a realist. I, I'm not saying we get rid of plea bargaining. I think it has a really valuable role uh, in our system. But I, I do think we've got to find ways to, to reinvigorate the trial process and, and have a little less plea bargaining. But I really do wonder what you think. Vakran, I think you just closed the door on you returning the Cato with that. So, <laughs> Vakran, I'm sorry, yeah, Shannon. Thank you. Uh, yes, this is just me speaking, and if I didn't say it earlier, I don't speak for any of our members. We have 330 elected prosecutors and thousands of assistants, and we don't speak for them. Um, I, I am tickled to no end at this new, that this recent um, obsession with the problems in plea bargaining. My experience as a prosecutor was defendants, their lawyers coming to me begging for less than what the state had said their crime was worth. And frequently, we would reach a negotiation and do something that all sides agreed, prosecutor, defense lawyer, and so defendant, and judge was just to move the case on down the system. The, this is one of those advocacy issues where the cost or the practical consequences on it would be astounding. As a, I mean, if I'm a prosecutor and you said, I have to try every case, Throw me in that briar patch. Let's go. That's why I went to law school. That's why I became a prosecutor, because I loved trying cases. But the reality is, say in a rural community in Texas, okay, uh, a DA may have a county where he gets 200 felony cases filed a year. He has a judge on a circuit who comes through his county, and he gets to have that judge in his county six times a year, 200 felony cases. That math doesn't work, right? 
So if you, what I never hear these advocates for more trial, more trial, more trial say is we really need to increase the number of courts, increase the number of defense lawyers, increase the number of prosecutors, increase juries. We can't get people to show up for jury service now because the level of civic education and sense of duty is so poor in this country. We can have, I've heard prosecutors who said we called 150 people for jury duty and five showed up. So we can't have jury trials if people aren't willing to participate in them. But the, that is a perfect example of how in academia or in a, a, a think tank, not a do tank, but a think tank, they come up with these ideas and say, oh, wouldn't this be great? But there is no answer to these questions of how are we really going to make that happen? And I understand the desire. People want more transparency. They want to know why these cases are going the way they're going, et cetera. But all of that costs money, all of it. There is no way around it. And so um, the system is the way the system is because that's what we're willing to pay for right now. And the other thing I'll add also is federal criminal justice and their sentencing guidelines and pleas very different from our state system in Texas where we have broad ranges of punishment. We allow a jury to sentence somebody, which is very unusual. Uh, so be careful not to uh, read about the federal criminal justice system and assume that things work the same way in Texas. Yeah, so I mostly agree with Shannon on this, that you know, often... Oh, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> I said mostly, um, but you know, when I, I want to put some qualifiers on it, I think you know, informed plea bargaining, where someone actually has a lawyer who has had access to all of the evidence in their case and can make you know meaningful legal advice, I don't see a problem with that. I think actually it's a good thing, and it's often in the client's interest to take whatever offer is on the table. Um, you know, one thing that I think would help, though, in Texas, or what I worry about are, you know, an innocent person taking a plea just to get out of jail. That, to me, is just a manifest injustice. Um, the other thing is when the prosecution gives kind of a decent offer because the sentencing ranges are so broad, as a defense attorney, sometimes it's hard to advise your client about what to do if they pick somewhere in the middle of that range. You know, you're rolling the dice to see if the jury is gonna come out with a longer sentence or a shorter sentence. So I think one reform that I'd like to see is to have the jury informed of what that plea offer is at trial to give them a benchmark about what an informed attorney thought this case was worth. And that's what's gonna happen to your plea offers. Uh, yeah, I know. Well, I mean, that's the, that's the consequence of that because it's been proposed before. But, uh, you know, again, when you make that chess move, other pieces are going to move in response to it. And what's going to, that's going to actually harm defendants because prosecutors are going to go, okay, jury's going to, this is going to set the bar for where the jury is going to be since we have jury sentencing. So all of a sudden, I'm going to start offering 20 years instead of 10 years. A but, floor, a floor then, not a ceiling. But, but then, well, you're, you're, I, I mean, I think that will happen to a certain degree in some jurisdictions, but then you're also going to have to then try all your cases. Is this case really worth it? You're supposed to act in the interest of justice. You should be applying your opinion as to what the proper sentence is. If you're just stacking it to have gamesmanship, I'd argue that that prosecutor is stepping outside of their function as a prosecutor. Well, and one other thing you point out is that all, you know, we have 254 different criminal justice systems, right? So many counties we have, they're all different. They all have their little bubble in which juries in one county, even neighboring counties, Williamson County to Travis County, right? Huge difference in your jury uh, verdicts and ha what they think a case is worth, so to speak. And so the problem with what the feds did is they said, we don't like all of this difference. We want to make everything equal. Isn't that just? Isn't that fair? Well, what happened is they made everything equal, and then it just keeps going up and up and up and up as they change these sentencing guidelines and harsher and harsher and harsher and harsher. Texas was smart in not doing it. What the Texas system is, instead of trying to have justice across the board and treat everybody the same, we are going to individualize a, an outcome for this particular person, for this particular crime and their background and these victims. And it means that different people may get treated differently, 
but that's a different, I think, a better form of justice than treating everyone the same, just making sure, but ending up treating them badly. But it's fair because everybody's getting treated badly. That to me is not just. Well, in fairness to the, the federal system, I mean, one of the things that happens there, you know, from the pragmatic standpoint as someone who practices or has practiced in federal court is that you don't have plea bargaining, you have charge bargaining. You know, when your client is coming in, you look at the evidence and you go to the prosecutor and figure out if you can almost pre-orchestrate a deal. That's, that is how it works in federal court. Um, you know, I think that with the sentencing disparities that we see in Texas, I think that's another reason why we need the data because it, I think courts should at a minimum know if they're an outlier. You know, people should know also what the racial effect is. And I think that there's actually an interaction between geography and race and sentencing. They're actually, and then far be it from me as the resident uh, academic nerd on the panel, not to chime in with this, um, this actually has been studied in a few places that have had an indeterminate sentencing system, but have adopted certain, whether it's mandatory minimums or enhancements, uh, that kind of actually conform criminal procedure around certain charges. So what we saw, where we see this most evidently, and they don't do this anymore, was in the 90s in Michigan, they actually prohibited plea bargaining for certain gun crimes. And now what happens is, what was happening then, is it actually went from a system that more or less roughly equated uh, you know, intake and process, uh, there was no disparities uh, through the board, However, once they started uh, barring plea bargaining, the racial disparities and issued sentencing went through the roof. And so that was one of the issues that has one of those unintended consequences simply because of the way things work. And, and the, the point Shannon was trying to make, as we understand justice by geography, I believe, is that the standards of each community are different. And you might have a rural community that's pretty uh, homogeneously white that has a very tough standard for certain consequences. And what you would see from that is a far greater over-sentencing based on geography that would have counterintuitive, at least counterintuitive to the narrative, uh, effects in the racial disparation. So that's just what I wanted to end on as an academic hearing himself talk. Um, <laughs> I would, uh, but unfortunately MK is giving me the hook right now. So what I'd like to offer is again, if you need uh, continuing legal education credit, come over here, sign up, uh, make sure you get that. Uh, we're gonna be around for a few minutes. You wanna talk to us after if you didn't get to uh, answer your question. But before we leave, just one more round of applause for our panelists, please. Thank you all for attending.